ago. Uh, so this is uh, Joel Bernier is speaking today. So Joel received his bachelor's in mechanical engineering and physics from Clarkson University and then went on to receive a PhD from also mechanical, mechanical and aerospace uh, at Cornell under Matt Miller, who he would argue with this, I'm sure, but I would call one of the, the grandfathers of X-ray diffraction. He would hate that. But um, so after that, uh, Joel worked at the Advanced Photon Source at Argonne National Laboratory as a postdoc and then joined Lawrence Livermore as a staff scientist in 2007 and has been there ever since, uh, doing all kinds of fascinating cutting edge X-ray uh, characterization experiments. Um, but what Joel's bio doesn't mention is that he single-handedly wrote the software that is predominantly used across the US and beyond for 3D, 3D X-ray diffraction grain mapping techniques, that's HexRD, which uh, really opened the door for dozens of research groups, um, several, several of which are here at Michigan to apply these powerful characterization techniques to any number of micromechanics and material science uh, problems. So take it away, Joel. Let me, um, well, thank you very much for the introduction. I wanna thank you uh, for the invite. Uh, as I was saying, let me go back to my, I have to share my screen first. <clears throat> there we go. Everyone can see? Slides? Yep, looks good. All right. Well, yes, I want to thank you uh, very much, Ashley and Karen. Um, I'm really bummed that I couldn't be out there in person, but as you could probably hear, I'm a little under the weather. Uh, probably the 10th cold I've had since the new year from the kids bringing it home from daycare, but I'm happy to do this uh, remotely. Um, <clears throat> it's great uh, in conversations I've already had uh, with people over there. And you, of course, Ashley, uh, it's very satisfying for me to know that I could actually, I'm, I'm never going to win a Nobel Prize. So the fact that I can make a tool that's that enabling other people to do some interesting science is, is satisfying for me. And um, I look forward, hopefully in this talk, maybe I can inspire some new ideas about uh, analysis modalities for uh, the type of data that we have access to now and, uh, and continue to forge some new collaborations going forward. Uh, the first thing I was always, uh, it's been about, I'd say, in earnest, we've been working on this almost, it, there's been a continuous thread that goes back about 10 years. Um, at Rezo back in the early mid 2000s, the first measurements were made by Henning Polson and others, kind of the originators of, of taking the rotation method and applying it to uh, polycrystalline samples, uh, really opened the door for, uh, everything that we see here into uh, these new techniques. You know, since then, uh, I actually ironically did not do any 3D XRD type measurements at Cornell when I was here as a grad student, despite the fact the synchrotron is in the backyard. But I started really when I met the Rezo guys at, uh, as a postdoc at Argonne. Uh, and since then, you know, the, the group, the community is, is pretty large. I've been really fortunate to work with uh, lots of bright people. Um, and in particular, I want to call out uh, AFRL has, has really, uh, since 2012, uh, had a continuous line of funding for this work, uh, particularly Paul Shade and uh, TJ Turner there. And they continue to put money into developing not only uh, paying me to help develop the analysis techniques, but they've uh, themselves developed and implemented a lot of the hardware that we're going to look at that enables some of these experiments. Um, there's the auspices for, you know, Livermore makes me put up uh, <laughs> the funding sources for the lab. So let's get started. Um, I, for those who aren't aware, I, I don't, I'm not sure about how much time I need to spend on this. I don't need to preach to the choir, uh, but I want to just give a brief overview of uh, hydrogen diffraction microscopy, HEDM. Uh, and its variants, some of the challenges that we have in terms of the data analysis, just to get everybody on the same page. Uh, but I really want to use this talk to uh, showcase some of the, uh, what I think are the most impactful uh, studies that's come out of the type of data that HEDM lets you measure. Um, and the, the unique thing I would say is that it's really, truly mesoscale data, and I'll go and I'll quantify what I actually mean 
the bite mesoscale, since it's a pretty nebulous term. Um, it lets you get at behaviors that are difficult. Uh, if you think of the idea of seeing an entire volume, it lets you zoom in or catch events that you might miss if you only had two-dimensional uh, surface resolving tools available. Um, and the fact that we can do these, these measurements, the fact that they are non-destructive um, since we have penetrating, penetrating power of hard x-rays is, is a really important uh, factor. Uh, enabling in situ tests. Um, so yeah, the goals, the stuff that we study, you know, these materials are very complex. Uh, it's like a, a many body problem with layers upon layers of complications and uh, that are affecting what we see in mechanical response. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to build at the same time data that follows the same uh, length scale hierarchies or, or bridges uh, hierarchies and length scale to develop some new insights. So diffraction is an extremely useful tool for us in material science because crystalline materials uh, exhibit this behavior. It's uh, constructive interference uh, that is the manifestation of the fact that the atoms are in uh, a periodic array. Uh, now we can use diffraction across of a big variety of length scales. Now, I'm specifically talking about X-ray diffraction here, but uh, you know, electron diffraction goes to even smaller length scales than I have here. Uh, neutron diffraction can go to even larger. Um, but if we focus on X-rays, there's three scales that I think get used in material science, if, if I want to use gross car uh, categories. Call macro scale bulk characterization. You don't get any spatial information, but this is your uh, classical texture analysis where you describe statistically with fields over the orientation space, uh, distribution of lattice orientations, distribution, you can do also distributions of uh, lattice strain and stress as a function of orientation. That's what I did a lot of my uh, PhD dissertation on. Uh, and then there's these two other mesoscales that I say, an intergranular mesoscale and an intragranular mesoscale. Um, and the intergranular, uh, we're talking that your beam size is now, your probe size is probably on the order of 1,000, uh, say, individual grains. Uh, and what we can access at that length scale with x-rays are kind of grain average properties. So it's average orientations, center of masses, <coughs> And importantly, strain and stress tensors. So we're actually getting full strain tensors uh, for those grains, even though they're averaged at, you know, over the grain at the intergranular scale. Uh, there's still a lot that we can do with that information. Uh, you can also get grain morphologies and boundaries um, if you use the near field variant of HEDM. And then at the intragranular scale, you can actually focus X-rays down with modern optics, and we're talking like hundreds of nanometer spot sizes with a with a ton of flux. You can get uh, intragranular uh, gradients and orientation and stress. There's even a variant of uh, uh, dark field microscopy applied uh, at this scale, where you can get both high angular and spatial resolutions for small volumes, so, you know, voxel sizes down to. You know, tens of nanometers um, if you have the right optics. Uh, you can do things like do correct direct, uh, you, while you can't image individual defects and dislocation at the dislocations at this scale, you have data that you can tie to uh, things like the nine tensor that uh, they give you an idea of populations of dislocations and how they might evolve. Um, we are focused here in this talk. Um, the other techniques are uh, sure there's other there's, there's other people that are more experts in both techniques, but uh, we're going to focus on the intergranular mesoscale and what we can do with it. And I was looking back because I, I thought I remembered this is back to the beginning of this project. There was a BES report on the need for mesoscale science. You know, kind of when we started all of this, and uh, it's a it's a horribly ill-defined term, but meso it really means this is a, it's an intermediate scale. It doesn't mean an absolute length scale, but for me, and this is my definition, I remember this goes back to when we were working on this report, you're bridging fine scale features and a volume big enough to contain a statistically significant ensemble of those fine scale features. So for us, <coughs> that's the scale of like individual grains. That's our, that's our fine scale unit um, that dominates a lot of the behavior that we see in polycrystalline materials. Um, and the fact that we can now resolve what's going on, at least in an average sense, for individual grains, but then look at a volume of thousands of these things 
Uh, that gives us an interesting point of view where we can we can think of things like um, slip and strength and you know, fracture as uh, emergent behaviors in the ensemble. So, so that's what mesoscale means uh, to me. So the measurement technology is actually dead simple. Uh, we can we can track aggregates uh, on that order of a thousand grains. It, it depends on uh, you can do many more uh, uh, or sometimes less. It depends on the uh, the state of your sample, how deformed it is. Um, but you can track these things evolving in time, which is why the technique is so powerful. Uh, currently, um, at uh, every hard X-ray synchrotron, to my knowledge, at this point has a beamline that does. Uh, at least Farfield uh, HEDM, uh, where, you, where you're resolving uh, grain average quantities, but not necessarily doing grain maps. Um, because there's a lot of working distance around the sample, there's a lot of options for ancillary equipment, loading stages, uh, furnaces, uh, but you can also combine pretty easily with other modalities like tomography and small angle X-ray scattering. Um, without getting in the way. Uh, you could kind of measure data concurrently, which is uh, really powerful if you want to also track features like voids and cracks opening. Um, so they always get the question from people whether or not 3D is necessary because it can be a pain dealing with 3D data. But I don't think I have to sell many of you guys that yes, not only are many of the features and fields we're looking at, they, they actually vary in 3D and 2D slices don't give you the full picture. I think more importantly than that is that when you look at a 3D volume, a full ensemble, um, you have the ability to detect rare events. Uh, if, you, if you're looking at things like twinning or phase transformations or you know, a hotspot developing that could be an initiation site for damage, you don't necessarily know where that's going to happen and you need to have a wide view in order to try to catch it, the sensitivity to catch it. And not only that, the extra dimension, obviously, multiplicatively, you just get better statistics in terms of tracking uh, what's going on in these individual grains. Um, I will say that I, I already mentioned that the, the technique at this point has evolved, I'd say, to maturity. Um, there's, there's multiple analysis codes out there for doing the data analysis. Beamlines generally, I think Diamond was maybe the last one on board, but they have a 3D XRD beamline, HEDM beamline uh, running now. Uh, the International Union of Crystallography actually has a commission trying to set up standards uh, and uh, best practices for analysis software, uh, specifically for these 3D techniques, including HEDM. Um, and I'd say that we mainly live in a world where we're detector limited, um, which is a good place to be because those developments kind of progress without us and without our input. And every time there's a fancier new detector that has a bigger dynamic range or a faster counting rate, we can just plug it right in and use it pretty much. Um, so yeah, the hard, it's a pretty lightweight technique on hardware. Um, I always throw this movie in because I like it. And it probably took like a year off my life when I made it originally. But just to remind everyone, the, the reason why we have to spin the sample around when you have monochromatic x-rays is because you can only satisfy a Bragg condition when the crystals orient, play, uh, lattice planes are oriented uh, at a very specific angle. So that green cone would represent the Bragg condition for these plane normals that are the red spikes coming out of my cube here. So if you rotate your sample while you frame your detector and you integrate over some finite rotation range, you can catch all of the Bragg conditions for an individual crystal. So you can imagine in a polycrystalline sample, your signals are very sparsely distributed around the detector. And you think of your data now as are all 3D images. They're stacks of frame uh, encoded by rotation angle of your sample. Uh, and when you have a polycrystalline sample, you know, up until the point where the patterns are so dense that you can no longer deconvolve, uh, you can go backwards from the data and uh, figure out which signal came from which grain, assign them all to orientations, and then zoom in on uh, where the signals actually come from. I also always include this feature. This is one of our titanium samples I'm actually going to show data from. But when you actually spin this, if you can see those shadows popping in and out, those are actually extinction spots from when those grains inside the boundary of that sample spinning around and this tomographic view are in a Bragg condition. So it means when you see it get a little darker in there, it's because 
that grain is satisfying a bragg condition at that orientation and that literally is an outline of the shape of the grain in the sample and there are techniques that actually directly use that for reconstruction to help get the grain maps but i always think that that's kind of a cool thing that you can actually see diffraction happening and even a radiograph when you're spinning around the sample so the two variants really boil down to where you put the detector um, we have near field and far field, which are sometimes people that are real microscopists get mad because those really mean things for uh, microscopists, which I won't claim that I am by any way, shape or form. But uh, near field means that the detector is very close to the sample. Your, your distance to the detector is roughly the same as your sample dimension. When you have the detector that close, you're very sensitive to the spatial origin of where your diffraction is coming from, and it lets you build 3D maps of orientation and a little bit of strain information uh, in 3D without sectioning. Uh, it's like an analog to CT. You can section your sample by uh, focusing your beam down to a line and moving, uh, taking measurements at the different layers in your sample. To some extent, you can uh, map full volumes at a time. It uses the same exact detector that tomography does. So you, for free, can both get your grain map information and have information to do reconstruction to look for things like voids and cracks uh, at the same time. Problem is it, it takes a long time um, and uh, get a little bit more into why it takes such a long time. And by itself, when you have the detector so close, what you give up is angular resolution on where the spots are coming from. So it does by itself have very limited strain resolution. But if you put a detector now far away, you know, a couple hundred to a centimeters to meters away, uh, what you can get is you have good orientation contrast, you give up spatial resolution, but because you have such good angular resolution, you can actually determine strain tensors uh, once you've indexed which spots belong to which grain. Uh, it's a very fast measurement and it gets faster with every other detector that comes out because it's generally single crystals of things like metals are really good scatterers and, and we're not even we're by no means flux limited to the synchrotrons already, and they're gonna shut down and give us more flux at a couple of these sources. So uh, it really comes down to how fast your detector can frame and how fast you can rotate your sample. Uh, and you can do both of those things pretty quickly. Uh, say down to 30 seconds of volume here, but I think that realistically uh, we can get to probably close to 10 seconds or maybe even better per volume uh, in the future. The drawback is you, you orientation is your main mode of contrast. So if you have two grains with the same orientation and separated across your sample or things like a multiple twin lamellae in a sample, you can't individually resolve them with far field alone. Um, so you can probably already see that these are very complementary techniques uh, and the strategy is really to field them together on the same instrument. So you get maybe a few maps at some critical states initially and maybe at some peak states and in between you can measure uh, far field states and basically color your orientation map with uh, at least grain average strain quantities. So like I said far field geometry just by diffraction it being kind of an angular dispersive technique what happens when you zoom on this data is that it basically compresses all of your signal to lie on these uh, cones. So if your detector is in transmission, these look like rings on your detector. And I have a little zoom in of some real data here that's been summed across multiple frames in Omega. And the gross position of where the diffraction spots lie in, uh, I wonder if I had laser pointer uh, enabled, but I don't. You can see the gross position, if you think in 3D for the signal coming from a single grain, the gross position of where all those spots would be uh, in the full 3D image encode the orientation of the grain. And it's the little deviations of where those spots are with respect to I've overlaid kind of these three lines would be the ideal powder ring position uh, for this material. And the little wobbles of each one of those spots away from where it's supposed to be encode the other nine parameters, three for position and six for strain. So there's, those two things ought to, uh, right in the beginning decouple very nicely, orientation and then position and strain uh, decouple. We take advantage of that in the analysis. Um, you can see in this little cartoon here, the effect of precession is a pretty obvious one. As, you, as your grain processes around the center of rotation, there'll be kind of like a harmonic wobble to the gross position of all of its spots that you can detect. Um, the primary requir requirements is that you need a big detector because if you go far away for angular resolution, you, if you want a big field of view, you need a big detector or you need to build an instrument out of multiple uh, detectors and tile them together. 
Small pixels are always great because they increase your ability to resolve each one of these spots and fit a distribution to it. And then framing speed. Um, and the latest generation of detectors are, are faster than we can hope to use already at this point. Um, near field, on the other hand, uh, Darren Pagan made this really nice graphic I have down the lower left that shows how orientation and strain gradients manifest themselves at different detector distances. Um, what happens is that your signals no longer fall on uh, Debye Schur, a single set of Debye Schur rings because your detector is so close, it's now very sensitive to where the grain was when it diffracted. So you kind of get these rings that are fat in the horizon if you look at this uh, line folks example I have at the top. So it's very hard. You can't automatically look at a spot and tell which reflection type it is anymore in near field. So it takes a, a little bit of a different approach. Not only that, because you're so close, the actual shape of the diffraction spot that you see on the detector uh, is a direct projection of the grain shape or whatever brag angle that you're taking off at. Um, so it, it's you, that's why you can use it effectively to reconstruct uh, the 3D map of orientation because you can, um, you're actually looking at different projections of the grain uh, shape. And it's, it's kind of like an iterative reconstruction that you would use for tomography. Um, you can obviously speed up the process of analysis if you run a far field experiment on a full volume and you have some master list of orientations you expect to see. Uh, you can seed your near field reconstruction with that and there are pretty big gains associated with not having to search blindly over the full orientation space. Um, the problem why it's slow is to get the spatial resolution, not to blur out the shape of your grain too much, you need a really thin scintillator. So typically these are done with a scintillating crystal that's doped a layer maybe only microns deep and then you couple the uh, microscopy objective to an optical C, uh, CCD that would look at the back of that scintillator um, and because the scintillator is so thin it's not very efficient it doesn't stop any x-rays so you typically just have to count longer so this is a place the near field can benefit from additional flux because uh, you just won't have to count as long at, at, a, at a given frame to get enough signal so sources of error, and um, the most of the systematic errors, as we've been at this for 10 years, we, we have the proper geometric models that have all the degrees of freedom that we want. Um, we know how to do really good calibration. Uh, detector distortions are things that we can also uh, characterize ahead of time and, uh, and remove that systematic error from the, uh, the data. Things like hardware synchronization, we've worked for years with the synchrotrons to get that right to minimize errors there. The real name of the game here is that somehow you have to go from these blobs of intensity that are distributed across frames in a 3D image uh, and turn that into vector components for a reciprocal lattice vector for, uh, associated with that Bragg peak. And when everything looks, you have a nice annealed material or not many crystals and everything looks nice and Gaussian, it's pretty straightforward. Um, there are many strategies for uh, indexing the orientation, but once you know where to look for the signals, you can fit it to a Gaussian or whatever profile you like um, and get the center. And there's your components that you need to, uh, to put into a least squares problem to solve for strain position, uh, refine the orientation. But, as you get to higher levels of deformation and your Bragg peaks start to smear out or you're trying to do volumes with uh, lots of grains or they're doing things like twinning and they're, they're forming new orientations as you deform, uh, spot overlap is the killer. Um, there are ways to mitigate it, but at, at some point, not every sample is gonna work. There's either you, you do few highly deformed grains or you can do more uh, well-ordered grains. But there is a point where things break down uh, and you can no longer uh, deconvolve on your in your detector space signals coming from individual grains. Uh, spot heterogeneity is a problem too, because if if your, your shape that you're trying to fit strays too far from a simple analytic uh, profile function, something symmetric, then you have to do more uh, complicated analysis. You would need a model that would tell you that you're looking for some weird lumpy spot based on what you're seeing. Uh, but if you're doing fits, you can rank fits by looking at residuals from the profile fits themselves, or if you have a higher order model. I think the point I want to get across here is that not only is there a lot of opportunity for how we do the identification of the signals and fit their centers, this is an iterative approach always. Uh, the simple approach is 
the quick and dumb one that will isolate the signals well enough to get a decent estimate for the orientation position strain. And once you're, you can put the signal that you need, however messy it is, in a window, then at least you have the opportunity to come in with the higher fidelity model and uh, see if you can make heads or tails about uh, fitting the precise shape that you see in the measured intensity. I added these slides because the conversation I had this morning, uh, we have thought a lot about spot overlap. Probably, I don't know if even Ashley, we've talked about this, but there's there's actually algorithms that we have for ahead of time, once you've just figured out orientations, being able to figure out where you're going to have spot overlaps in your grain. So what we're looking at here, these are actually two real signals that came from a titanium data set. It's a montage plot. So imagine the way we attack the analysis is that we have a, a rubric for figuring out the orientations that are giving uh, rise to the intensity that we see in the detector. Once you have that, you know the region in the image space where all of your signals for every grain should be. So you can imagine that you're going to put a box around that. And the angular dimensions are the Bragg angle, the azimuth, and that's on any given frame. And then basically the number of frames that uh, you want to draw a 3D angular box around where your signal is. So on the left here, it's a montage plot. So kind of going across the top, you have increasing uh, frame number. When you're well calibrated and you have a good fit for your grain, the peak should appear in the middle box and maybe there's tails on either side. And that's what we see for a nice clean isolated. I think this is a 10 bar 10 spot. Um, I forget what the angular uh, distance is here. I didn't uh, write what the omega spacing is probably a quarter degree between each one of those frames. Uh, but quite often, and this happens with increasing frequency as you put more grains in your diffraction volume, or in cases where you have highly textured samples where there's basically a cluster uh, on the detector where you're going to have a lot of signals overlapping, uh, you can get spots overlapping like I saw here. This is actually a case of three, uh, where there's two spots that almost completely overlap. Um, in the middle frames there. And then there's another guy that creeps in maybe just a quarter degree after the tails of the other. At least the current algorithm will ignore that peak that comes in the end because it's looking for the one closest to the middle of the box. But if you have two signals overlapping, you're not going to get a good, uh, if you try to use that one without any additional information to get a uh, vector components for where the center of that peak is, it's gonna be corrupted because it's really coming from two different signals. Um, and there's ways we can mitigate that in terms of like going to filter outliers out of uh, the fits for the grains, but uh, filtering them ahead of time is, is a, if you can do it easily is, is what we try to do. So it turns out that you can actually employ a simple clustering analysis. Um, if you plot on the unit sphere for every reflection you have, the unit diffraction vectors where they intersect the sphere, uh, because you're looking for things that are really, you know, maybe only a couple degrees apart, uh, you can just use a simple Euclidean metric to do angular clustering of the vectors. And uh, as long as you know, it just have a list of orientations ahead of time, you can basically condense out places where you know you're going to have overlapping peaks and kind of set those aside for further analysis later. Um, so yeah, that's something that we do that worry about. It's not always in the standard kind of analysis pathway, but uh, it's probably something that we should get in there. Now, one place that you have overlaps, 100% overlaps, is if you're looking at twins, uh, the formation of twins or phase variants that have a habit plane, the habit planes between parent and product um, domains overlap completely. And it just so happened in, in writing this to kind of just get rid of incidental overlaps, or it was like, oh yeah, this, this thing can actually be exploited to find twins um, from your sample knowing nothing else going in. It doesn't care about space group, doesn't care about, uh, as long as you give it the habit plane uh, that you know, the ring that has the habit plane to do this analysis, you can find all the places where you have uh, overlaps and you can go and test out of those populations, which ones are also satisfying a twin relationship. So this could be a useful tool for uh, some research going on there for you. Um, I have just a couple of slides I want to move through quickly here, uh, but for the hardware nerds out there, uh, one of the great things in the collaboration I've had with Air Force is that uh, they've actually built some really, really cool hardware for mechanical testing in situ. Uh, the first one was built as an insert and it still exists and still gets used. Uh, it was built as an insert for an MTS frame. The real innovation 
was that the grips rotate inside the frame. So you have an unobscured 360 degree rotation range uh, for your sample. So it's great for tomography, great for HEDM. Uh, these big air bushings that come from precision lathes uh, that can take, I think this was a two kilonewton load, which is plenty when you're talking about samples with about a millimeter cross-sectional area. Uh, but the one thing I wanted to get across here when we look at that is that the working distances are huge for far field. Uh, near field, you have to play some tricks about being able to do measurements to get the detector in that close. But for far field by itself, I mean, we're, we're meters away. So there's all kinds of room for your load frame, for designing furnaces uh, for your sample, as long as you can get x-rays out the other side. I know there's a special uh, radioactive material containment vessel that they have at Argonne. I believe that they, uh, they use it one ID here. Uh, and as I said before, one way to get around the uh, fact that detectors come in, you know, whatever the limited size, right? 40 centimeters is actually enormous for an X-ray, a flat panel X-ray detector. So one way to cheat and get the coverage you want angularly uh, and to be able to have the big working distance for high angular resolution is that you tile detectors uh, to form your single instrument. So that puts some, uh, onus on the software to be able to handle multiple detectors uh, and be able to calibrate this thing up front. Uh, but all of the fancy new detectors are all multi-element detectors even by themselves inside the footprint of one of these single detectors. So we've kind of future-proofed ourselves uh, in terms of uh, being able to handle these data. And the other thing I want to point out is, as I mentioned before, when you start tiling detectors here, you can put gaps in them. The direct beam in this setup can go straight through to a tomography or sax detector that's at the back of the hutch. And you can start to combine modalities and really get a ton of data. Um, right now, there's two, these frames that Air Force built, there's, uh, there's two of each flavor uh, at Argon and Chess. Uh, the two at Chess are, are screw driven and the new one at Argon is, uh, is also, it's a standalone screw driven unit. It, it, uh, separate from the one that is made to fit in the MTS. Uh, and the latest, the RAMs 3 and 4, not only can they do, we learned a lot from building the first two machines, they double the load capacity, uh, increase the speed that they can rotate, but they can also do multi-axial loading now. Uh, and so we've done a pilot torsion experiment that I think Paul's talked about uh, before uh, on RAMs 3 at chess and RAMs 4 that will be at, uh, I'm sorry, RAMs 3 at APS and RAMs 4 that will be at chess. So that opens, the, uh, the idea that we can do multi-axial loading opens all kinds of possibilities in terms of the type of in-situ test we can do. Um, and you can see already at RAMs 3 and 4, 30 degrees a second is how fast we can kind of steadily rotate these things. So we can, we can potentially, with a detector that can frame fast enough, do very quick volumetric scans of our samples. You could even have the thing spinning continuously and if everything was encoded, you could basically, just like they do with tomography, just start your scan and know where your angular position is um, at you know, any prescribed time that you want during your load history. Uh, obviously the speed, I would make it, there's a lot of cases where you don't want to sit and, and take a measurement while you wait, like we used to with neutrons because your material might be relaxing and the state might be evolving if you're trying to hold it at load. So the ability to just take images as you're, um, like on the flow surface, uh, doing a monotonic loading experiment is really, really powerful. Uh, I'll do a quick plug for the software. Um, there's at least to my knowledge, three packages out there at this point that users can go download and use uh, to plow through these data sets. Uh, HexRD is the project that I started and uh, we still maintain it's open source in, uh, on GitHub. And when we get funding, we, we get help from uh, Kitware and some other companies to make the GUI nicer. But uh, the emphasis in designing the software is on modularity, extensibility, and uh, usability so people can come in and not just use the program as we package it, but take the pieces and build new capabilities. And I think that um, at least for sure, Ashley's done that uh, and other groups, I think, as well. Um, and that's, that's great. I mean, that's kind of what the design, the intent is to make it uh, sane enough to be able to put the pieces together and, and uh, do new things with it. Uh, it does do powder, Laue, and HEDM uh, inside. I'm, I'm stuck in powder diffraction days uh, mostly uh, right now, so it's nice to come back to HEDM once in a while. Uh, it also has basic label and read felt fitting uh, if you need to do things like fit lattice parameters for an alloy. Um, and we've done a lot of work recently in the last couple of years with some money that we got from Air Force to do some optimization 
um, in the, especially in the HEDM workflow. Uh, and we're working currently on buttoning up the near field uh, diffraction workflow to be uh, a little bit more seamless uh, and mirror the way that we've uh, written a nice command line interface for the, the far field workflow. And we want to actually extend this as well to be able to handle lab source data where you have uh, like an x-ray tube has you know two characteristic energies at the emission line and that that requires some changes in the code but we don't want to have this thing be limited to only look at synchrotron data because that's a fraction of the total amount of x-ray data that's floating around out there there's no reason why we can't use a lab source to do some of these measurements um now I'll just get in with the rest of the time. I just want to step through a couple of studies with you. Um, there's a lot of really interesting applications for uh, the type of data that we can get, uh, the intergranular uh, strain data. Uh, from state variable determination, and uh, there's been studies both on, on trying to measure uh, in actual alloy systems in the polycrystal slip system strengths, but also single crystal elastic moduli. Uh, there was a paper from uh, should update my reference. Uh, one of our collaborators, Don Boyce, wrote a paper uh, last year, I think, on a, on a new way to do that, a nice inverse problem for doing that from HDM data. But we can also, because we're looking at an ensemble, we can start thinking of per mechanism analysis um, for things that we know are happening on the individual grain scale. And, and that's not just looking at the kinetics of uh, trying to build actual flow rules for the single crystals, but looking at things like twinning. Uh, phase transformations, you can look at solidification, because as the grains start to solidify and grow from melt, you can actually track them when they appear in the detector. Um, you can also really excitedly bracket critical events happening in the material, whether that be damaged nucleation uh, or just intermittency that you see in deformation anyway, strain bursts, uh, and I have a really neat example of that. Uh, and then, of course, microstructure evolution. Um, in the near field, we've done there's been a, a bunch of studies. And initially, what the RISO and ESRF guys uh, cared about was looking at grain growth and anomalous grain growth in annealing experiments. And that's really what they developed the initial grain mapping techniques for. And they're really good at it. Um, and you can even buy from Zeiss a uh, lab source machine that's set up to do grain maps in in your lab without having to go to the synchrotron anymore. And they've, they've been able to stretch it to um, not just perfect samples. So it, it's been exciting to see what they've, uh, how they push it um, in that space. So let's look at an example where we actually um, are using this ensemble data to get a really important state variable. And that's, you know, modeling parameter, uh, the slip system strengths. So we picked back in the day, uh, alpha titanium, uh, we kind of were strategically choosing something that would yield an interesting measurement at first, uh, because not only do you have, yeah, it's, it's relatively elastically, uh, it's not so anisotropic, but there's a, a, a big, uh, the stiffness to strength ratio is pretty low. So you end up getting enormous lattice strain. So we figured it would be a good place to start in terms of having a really strong strain signal. But then of course, titanium is really interesting because it's so plastically anisotropic. So you have these competing slip systems that depending on how it's alloyed and processed, uh, that can have wildly different activation uh, strengths. And not only that, uh, different uh, hardening behavior even. Um, so we picked this to do our initial experiment where we did you know, monotonic uniaxial tension. But the first time we did these measurements, I think was 2009 uh, is when we actually had enough hardware synchronization to do continuous loading. So unlike the neutron diffraction experiments, we have to count forever. We usually have to load up to some uh, point on the stress strain curve and then relax off of it to do your measurement over hours and not accumulate too much creep. Uh, we could move fast enough where we could actually capture states that weren't evolving too much uh, by loading at you know, 10 to the minus seven or so uh, strain rate. So we used the RAM sensor at APS. Uh, here's some rough dimensions. Like I said, the, the, the typical dimensions we're talking about here are order of millimeter uh, for sample sizes. The, the field of view that you have in terms of the size of the X-ray beams without using any optics to blow it up are around that order of magnitude. Uh, so cubic millimeter is a good rule of thumb in terms of the type, the general size volumes that we have. Now here's my strain rate, five times 10 to the minus seven. So you're pretty slow, but 
at least we know it's not evolving too much from uh, snapshot to snapshot of the volume. I think it took us 15 minutes to map a full volume at this time because our detector had a limited memory buffer and we had to wait for the thing to read it out every 60 degrees that we scanned the thing. It's, it seems cute now, you know, that we have like fast detectors, <laughs> but uh, we did measure near field orientation maps before and after, uh, which is kind of standard practice because you get these nice pretty gray maps where you can look at your microstructure. You can see from the map that we have sectioned here that it's pretty equiaxed. This is well-aged TIE 7 aluminum, which is a kind of an academic surrogate for the alpha phase that you would see in most of the engineering alloys in terms of it's got roughly the, the right aluminum content. And the vanadium and other elements usually segregate to the beta phase when you have duplex titanium alloys. Um, so the idea was that we would load this thing, look at what was happening with the stresses, periodically look at tomography to see if any cracks or voids were opening up. So if we look here, uh, what I'm plotting, they're kind of color coded with those uh, points along the stress drain curve. These are histograms of the uh, hydrostatic and uh, von Mises stress for something like 500 grains in the sample together. And just looking at these gross trends, you can kind of see things that make sense, right? The mean is moving as it's uh, loading up, but then you can see that the variations are also starting to increase, but really markedly after the thing yields. So you're getting a bigger uh, distribution of stresses. And we expect this. We know that there's a lot of heterogeneity in what's going on. But it gets really interesting when we take advantage of the fact that we have full tensors, we can start projecting that stress down onto different mechanisms of interest. And in this case, you know, we, we pick these four slip systems and we can now look at what the projection of the resolved shear stresses look like uh, as histograms on each of these mechanisms. And, and then the trick is, can we actually use these data to learn something about what slip systems are active and what their activation strengths might be? There's a couple of other, I just put this slide up here for, this was kind of a clap back for uh, people that want simple two point uh, or, or one point correlation functions. But if we look here, if I try to look for trends, coaxiality in this case is just, um, it's basically think of it in stress vector space. It would, a coaxiality of zero would mean that you are at a uniaxial, you're, you're aligned with a uni applied stress state. <coughs> and 90 degrees away would be something completely different. But if you just look at, if you sort things by how close to the macroscopic stress uh, um, the individual stress states are at these individual load states and try to suss out some trends. There's really nothing much happening there. The weird kind of envelope that the hydrostatic stress uh, follows is, is, has to do with the fact that uh, the macroscopic stress state is uniaxial. So it kind of brackets things at the, uh, when you're really close to uniaxial, what the variation can be. But other than that, if you look at the von Mises stress, there's more scatter as you get to weird stress states that are really far away from uniaxial at the local level. There's a little bit more scatter, but there's, there's not really a trend. Similarly, if I just look at the angle of, uh, say, basal planes with respect to the loading direction and think that that might be like a hard orientation and, and sort things out in terms of how the stresses might be, there's, there's really no trend that you can see here. We have to look at something a little deeper. Uh, if you have fine time, if you're doing continuous loading, you have lots of time resolution, and these plots are a little hard to follow, but what they really are, they're stacks of those histograms of resolved shear stress from the entire ensemble of grains for these four different mechanisms, plotted effectively in time or increasing macroscopic strain. And automatically, you can actually start seeing some interesting things happening now that we have better time resolution. Uh, you can see transient softening in the prismatic uh, slip system there where there's kind of elastically loads up after the shakedown uh, to some maximum stress then drops a little bit and evolves uh, with the broader distribution going out. Um, and similar trends happening with uh, the pyramidal C plus A or loading up and then just having some massive uh, variability to them. So if we think of a method of extracting these, and this was a nice paper that Darren, when he was my postdoc uh, that we worked on, at each measured state, because we have an ensemble, we have this mesoscale data, we can look at a distribution of, uh, at every load state that we looked at, we can look at a distribution of what the resolved shear stresses on each of these slip systems is doing. Uh, and then what we did was we used a, a KDE to uh, smooth the experimental histograms. And we, 
I mean, kind of an arbitrary choice, but we came up with just a, an analytic function to fit the high side, saying that you know, once the things to the right of that peak, those things are probably all grains in a rate dependent sense that are on the yield surface. And the width of that high side tail is giving you an idea of the distribution of flow stresses that you might have uh, for the grains that are, are yielding. Um, and because we have a lot of data, we need to automate this and be consistent in terms of how we fit it across different um, the different load steps for the different slip systems. So we cooked up this just simple analytic function fitting a tange to the high side there to give us both tau star would be kind of the, the position of the mean. And then there's a variance around it that W uh, sub tau is giving us an idea of the spread about the mean. So what we can do is basically build slip system strength evolution curves from these data uh, where you see like the we have the width and each one of the points on these curves is coming from the mean and the width from those fits for all the states that we measured in far field. So here you can very clearly see that the basal and prismatics, there's this interesting transient softening behavior that happens. Turns out that it is related to this was aged titanium. So it has uh, these alpha two uh, type three aluminum precipitates that end up ordering themselves. And it is known that uh, they can shear uh, and they pr promote kind of uh, slip bands in the material. So that transient softening is likely due to the fact that we're, we're seeing kind of a mesoscopic effect of these uh, really fine scale features that we're not resolving in the measurement. And then the C plus A looks like, you know, kind of like a stress strain curve where there's like, a, you could maybe say that there's a relatively not too high initial flow stress, but then it hardens like crazy. Uh, also backed up by TEM studies where, um, the, uh, the interaction of the C plus A dislocations with force dislocations is, is well known and um, as a hardening mechanism. So the interesting thing from a modeling perspective is that we not only don't just, or we're not just fitting things blindly to a very high level integrated measurement of the macroscopic stress strain curves or even the mass macroscopic stress strain curves plus say pole figures that are evolving during deformation. But we now have kind of a length scale down that we're making the model also give us the right uh, distributions for the individual slip mechanisms that are happening in the grains. What I'm showing here, Darren uh, and Nathan ended up, you know, phenomenologically, but physics based, you know, I would say it's still better than just throwing like a machine learning approach at this to say, okay, just give me some parameters that fit these distributions. We're saying, we know this probably these, these precipitate softening, so we'll put in a term for that. We know that there's the force dislocation uh, contribution that should uh, contribute to the C plus A hardening. And lo and behold, without too much sweat, we can, we can make a model with these basic phenomenological pieces agree pretty well with the data that we're measuring. And that's what we're looking at left and right here. More interestingly, if we zoom back out, and I think this is the point I wanna drive across, the macroscopic stress strain curves that come from this model with the exception of the, the one that doesn't have any at the alpha two uh, strengthening that comes in a little low there. You can make a lot of combinations of the mesoscale data, what's happening at the, uh, the slip system level as an ensemble, may give you the same looking stress strain curve at the macro scale. And you can be completely off in terms of how you're distributing the contributions of these different mechanisms. Uh, and I've given a couple examples here of what happens when you do things like you make the C plus A too strong, or you uh, don't put in the alpha two, the, the transient softening down in the lower right and the inset D there, or no C plus A hardening at all. Uh, you, you basically can get curves that aren't like horribly far off. We're looking at a very zoomed in portion around the knee of the curve here, uh, yet you have completely different distributions of what's going on at the individual scale of individual slip systems. Um, and the alpha two contribution also, and I have another study that we're gonna roll into after this, uh, promotes uh, localization as well. So it likely getting that right by making it match this mesoscopic data, not just the macroscopic, uh, has big implications for understanding uh, localization, uh, places that would be a high probability of nucleate damage. So we also did this experiment, just this is an advertisement, there was a quick script that we did showing that we uh, we can do this at elevated temperature at well, as well, and you get completely different distributions. The scales are different right to left because the, uh, the, activate, the flow stresses are much lower at elevation temperature as we'd expect. But you also see the disappearance in the same exact material of that softening, the transient softening behavior from the alpha two because they no longer really pose much of a barrier with that much thermal activation. 
um, and reduce hardening in the, the saturation of the C plus A as well. Um, we haven't done a ton with the furnace yet, but uh, this was the first study we did. It was nice to be able to get um, interesting looking data out of it. Uh, the effects you can also look at here is if you play with different alloying and uh, different aging to get these precipitates to come out or not. This was pretty coarse scale measured data, but right away without doing any massaging of the data, just running the experiment and doing the same exact reduction on it, you can see that there's difference in behavior and uh, the prismatics look pretty much the same. They go up and they saturate, but there's a, a, a big difference in terms of how the basal slip systems are behaving. There's not like the strengthening and the activation. Uh, if you think of the middle of the high side of those histograms is uh, in the age material with the precipitates, it promotes basal slip and channeling of basal slip. And you can see that with the fingerprint of that. And also there's an effect on the hardening, apparent hardening that you get in the, the pyramidal C plus A and the pyramidal A. There's a much more interesting study uh, that's at the end of this section. Uh, the other thing we can look at, because we have time resolution, and this is the cool stuff, is that we know that the deformation is not, doesn't pro progress in this nice viscous uh, sense, but it's really jerky and intermittent. So what we're looking at here in these, uh, this abstract art here is every row of these images is basically the stress history of an individual grain. There's 350-ish grains in this volume. What we're plotting is uh, it's step to step the, the difference, uh, the, the numerical derivative of what's going on with the stress. So right away without doing anything, you can look at the von Mises stress on the left there and you can see where macroscopic yield is. Because where it's all just kind of pink there, you're getting more or less monochronic, uh, monotonic increasing of the effect of stress during elastic loading on bulk. There's a couple of grains that are doing some interesting stress drops in there before macroscopic yield. But you can more or less see around the point where it starts to yield, you have uh, blue means that you have a big stress drop in that grain over a step. Red means you have stress building up. And what's really interesting, the places where you have red and blue next to each other in like a serrated fashion, you have a buildup and a release, and a buildup and a release. Um, the hydrostatic's not doing as, uh, as much of an interesting thing as the, as the deviator, but we can take a quicker look at the uh, closer look at this. So if I plot on the centroids, uh, this is during a tension test, looking at stress drop events as we're going up. So this is basically jerky plasticity uh, where things really started happening was around macroscopic yield here. Um, and this is only looking at one component of the strain, but what's happening is that we're looking at a whole volume so we can detect these rare events going on in individual grains inside this whole volume because we are doing mesoscale resolution where we're looking at individual grains, but an ensemble of them. There, isn't a many, there aren't many other techniques that have that type of ability to resolve these. Um, our collaborator, Armand Bodwin wrote a really nice paper looking at a creep study that we did at room temperature. Um, where the top left there, there's a cluster of grains here. You can look at the kind of crazy difference in behaviors that you have. And this is just under creep loading what's happening. But you can see there's, there's grains that have like grain A had just a big single event load drop. Grain B had kind of several events, a big one, and then a couple of small magnitudes. Grain C was adjacent to these two. This was all in a cluster and it's actually taking on load uh, at the same time the others are uh, dropping. And then there's this guy just going along for the ride at grain D. Uh, so I mean, it's insane the level of heterogeneity that you have even in a local neighborhood in your material. Not only that, uh, looking at some post-mortem on the sample on the, for a surface grain, we actually saw a slip band pop in to the outside of the sample after one of these big stress drops, which is exactly could explain the type of phenomenon that you'd expect that could explain these stress drops. So in this movie, the cool thing about this, now we're looking at magnitude of stress, but you see when these events pop in, and nowhere in the analysis uh, or the data reduction are we telling it that these events are correlated spatially in any way. You're getting that information for free. But you see those large events usually aren't happening in isolation, but you have a cluster of grains that together is uh, uh, either loading up or unloading in a big burst, which has real implications for how deformation is getting transmitted across clusters of grains, which is one of the big thing, one of the hard things to capture in the models. Um, we even saw through the course of the experiment place where we had low drop, there was actually a little crack that popped it from the surface or grew uh, from the surface. 
So this is a place where adding tomography for our measurements really can enhance the uh, the, the dimensionality of the data set that you, uh, the range of phenomena that you could track. So what Armand did was actually showed, this was kind of a neat study, but uh, the frequency of these events actually follows uh, power law of scaling. And there were these papers that show that like sea ice dynamics and like earth like plate tectonics also follow power laws with uh, and stress releases with similar frequency, which is kind of interesting. But the nice thing I think that he did, which leads me into the, the, the really recent study I want to show you is that that red curve up there is actually a CCDF. So a complementary cumulative distribution function. So it means like, what's the probability it starts at one and, uh, and what's the probability of an event of a magnitude greater than the stress drop or strain drop in this case that we're looking at uh, would happen. So it gives you a, a nice way of looking at the distribution of these, uh, the magnitude of these uh, stress drops. Beyond that, uh, plotting these information, uh, the magnitude of an event versus both the maximum basal and maximum prismatic uh, resolved shear stress clearly shows that there's a correlation with the biggest events with the, uh, the basal uh, slip. So I would say, yes, this, you can't do this analysis if you can't resolve the entire volume at the level of the individual grants. So we're really looking at things happening at, uh, within small clusters of uh, individual grains uh, inside a uh, volume of you know, hundreds to a thousand. So this data was just published on archive a week ago. And uh, our colleagues at uh, Felicity uh, and David Dye at Imperial kind of took this a step further. And being the titanium experts that they are, they brought two age states. So aged in this case means that you, you develop ordering, you precipitate this type three aluminum that's well ordered, uh, promotes uh, localization of slip in the basal planes. But they also played with the oxygen content because the oxygen acts as a, it can pin dislocations. It's a, as an interstitial. So there's these four samples. We have aging and not aged, or quenched and aged, and then different oxygen contents. So you can see that they have quite different um, creep behaviors in the little inset at the top here. The, the top left there is showing kind of what the experiment looked like. We did stress holds where we bring it up to a, a certain fraction of the yield stress and then wait for it to creep and then ratchet it up uh, over the course of the experiment. And then at each one of those steps, we're just measuring continuously looking for stress drop events. So these complementary uh, CDFs have been normalized. We kind of plot them all on the same scale here. In this case, the horizontal axis is the magnitude of the equivalent stress uh, drop uh, in one of these events. So one of the things that you can see is that the aging increases quite a bit. There's that gray dashed line that's just there for uh, a visual guide. But what happens when you age the material and you get that, uh, the precipitates in there that are promoting um, slip bands, you get a huge increase in the uh, magnitude of these events, uh, especially the one with the oxygen, uh, it's further forcing things to go into bands at the bottoms of the tail. So you're getting few really large stress bursts which probably are really deleterious in terms of things like damage to nucleation. Uh, big concern with this material is dwell fatigue, uh, where you can uh, get failure at even only like 60% of the macroscopic yield stress in uh, jet engine parts. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the nice thing it seemed if you look at quench material and you can kind of use alloy, this is what 0.25% uh, oxygen. The top right there is kind of the good case where you've homogenize the bursts to occur, uh, to have a smaller magnitude and a higher frequency of, uh, which probably is the better way to go in terms of uh, the fatigue uh, behavior of this material. Really cool study, it's just out there. I forget, I think we submitted it to uh, Nature Communications or something, uh, but it's on archive now for anyone who wants to download it. Um, really neat application of HDM data. The last thing I just wanted to show, this was like a toy problem that I did. Having to put some material together for this talk, I had to revisit some of this data. But uh, not only is the H, I mentioned kind of offhand that HEDM is really great for twinning studies because you're sensitive to seeing when new orientations pop out. It's also really great for uh, phase transitions, solid, solid phase transitions. 
So I did this ages ago, presented this at AGU, I think in 2012, but uh, in the literature, and you look at powder diffraction, there were these two mechanisms for how hexagonal, I mean, um, BCC iron transforms under pressure to hexagonal. This is very, this is like the marquee problem in high pressure material science for both the shock physicists because they discovered it first, but then the core of the earth is probably in the hexagonal iron phase, very well studied, but no one had kind of sussed out which one of these mechanisms. And it's because really they only give you products that are about five degrees apart. So if you do powder diffraction, you can't tell which mechanism uh, was active. But five degrees is plenty if you start with a single crystal and you study which uh, uh, variants form using HEDM. What I showed up here is kind of, you can distill for any given ring through your image series when you measure far field, uh, you can make basically coverage on a pole figure. And I did the really dumb analysis of just plotting where the variants should pop intensity into these particular reflections we're looking at. And you don't have to do much, much hand waving to see that it's clearly the burgers mechanism, not the other. And not only that, I can actually also look at what the, uh, in the product phases, what the, um, what the deviatoric stress is doing. So you can even get an idea of bounding the strength of the high pressure phase here. In this case, it was in uh, methanol, ethanol water, which freezes right around the transition pressure for iron. And when it freezes, you no longer are doing hydrostatic loading. You're kind of doing constrained, uh, constrained uniaxial compression. So you can actually see the split in the in-plane uh, C-axis and the outer plane C-axis, uh, and the width of that split is related to the strength of the material. Really cool study. But then I remembered I measured zirconium as well, which has a similar story where uh, Dallas Trinkle from when he was at Los Alamos, he did his dissertation on a, a atomistic model for basically predicting phase transformation pathways based on some nudge elastic man calculations. And they actually predicted that there was this uh, TAO, I think it was for titanium alpha omega phase variant um, that was energetically was much more favorable than the one that was traditionally accepted uh, from Silcock. Uh, so did the same thing. It's like, let's put a crystal in there and just uh, see what happens. And uh, there's three variants for the Silcock. Uh, I think my grain that I put in there, my little sample actually ended up having three grains in it. Um, from the little puck I got from Princeton. But I literally just revisited this and looked at it last week and I see, huh, as far as I know, this is the first experimental evidence of this, uh, this predictive pathway for the phase transformation. So I should probably write this up. But uh, this, the, for the Silcock, there's one that kind of serendipitous, the, uh, the red circle there in the green square kind of matches up with some orientations, but it totally whiffs on all those other orientations. Whereas the other pathway completely captures all of the intensity that you see uh, in the formed omega phase. So the wide open in terms of the materials that you want to look at. I know that Ashley, when I first met her, was looking at Nitai. I did a lot of work on the uh, solid solid transformation there, but uh, incredibly useful tool for sussing out um, relationships, not only for twinning, but phase transformation pathways. So this was a really fun problem to actually get to work on. <coughs> so that brings me to the end. Um, I'd say that you know, the data, I think where we are right now, we know how to measure the data. We know how to process it for most cases, you know, uh, outside of like really extremes of deformation. I think we're at a point where it would be really useful to start bringing in some of the computer science people, uh, or anyone that has a, a deeper knowledge of some of the ML uh, and AI techniques, if only for helping automate some of the analysis and uh, be able to detect some of the features in a, a little bit of more of a robust way. But uh, <coughs> if we want to move towards actually building predictive failure models, for example, uh, from the type of data that we have, uh, we need a lot more. And there's a real motivation here, and I think we're trying to do this with the DMI initiative to share data sets, um, you know, within a reasonable time after measuring them, and be able to promote access to beamlines. And part of the access to beamlines problem is that we have to have a pipeline in place that just makes the measurement of these data as efficient as possible. So we need more grains, we need more states, more samples to build up a, a data set that actually we can go and mine for behavior. Um, I don't even think at this point we really have to worry at all about trying to get higher resolution. I think that we have 
plenty of resolution to attract some of the more pressing problems we have in uh, understanding failure mechanisms uh, where we are. Uh, and maybe we can even be clever in terms of uh, how we can segment data from a contiguous sample into many RVEs to kind of try to multiply the amount of data that we have. But we really need to push as a community if we want to use these things uh, more regularly, we need to push for continued funding for getting the pipelines working because it's hard enough to get beam time. And if it takes a week to get to the point where you're starting to measure data, that's just not sustainable in terms of being able to grow this community. Um, I think we also need to start, uh, there's always room, I'm always kind of saddened when I look at some of the amazing stuff that people come along and present with uh, AI techniques applied to material science because there seems to be a lack of insight. You get a model that fits what you see and you can fit across a broad spectrum of uh, data from the same uh, phenomenon you're looking at. But there's, there's always the, uh, I think the opportunity here, like what, what Darren did, what Felicity did with smart analysis to still inject as much physics as we can uh, into the description of what we're looking at here. Um, but clearly there's an opportunity. There's just so much data to go through. I think that we're at the point now where we can start trying to solicit help from the people that really uh, know the state of the art techniques there to, to try to make heads or tails or, or try to glean some of the trends that might be happening uh, in different projections of the data that we have. And there's, of course, there's lots of room still, like I showed at the end there, targeted studies where you have cleverly designed samples with inclusions or notch bars that you can really focus in on um, uh, particular behavior, especially if you think of doing experiments with like this multi-zoom technique where you, you look at a core scale waiting for some critical event to happen. And then once you see something happening in a particular area or sample, you zoom in at a higher resolution just in that neighborhood of grains. Uh, and as always, this really, really begs for as close coupling to models as possible, even to the point of where the models can be used to be guiding measurements in situ and what you're looking at. So that's my kind of pontification on the outlook of where the field is right now. And I want to thank everyone for their attention and, um, and the invite and welcome any questions people have. <coughs> Thanks, Joel. Um, I'll take questions from the audience first. You can turn off your mics or ask them in the chats. Yeah, I, I have one. Yeah. Hey, Joel. Yeah, sorry that you were sick and couldn't be here in person. I know. Yeah. <laughs> the downside of, about the only downside of having a two-year-old, right? Or whatever, <laughs> however old they are, <laughs> three. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so first, just <coughs> thank you for HexRD and all you do there. That's awesome. You know, it's really incredible tool that's, you know, I'm relatively new to this uh line of research. And so it's been amazing to, to have that ability, that, that tool. Um, uh, one, my question had to do with this, your point here about using machine learning uh, for mm. automatic analysis. And so uh, I don't know if Duncan had a chance to talk to you, but you know, he's been working on this twin uh, classification in magnesium alloys and uh, you know, some really detailed and hard work, but lately we've uh, been talking with some collaborators at uh, University of Tennessee to use machine learning to sort of automate that. But then really uh, what I see is the real benefit here is the possibility of doing some of the initial parameter optimization, because that's, unless you're Joel Bernier or Ashley, uh, that, you know, that's, 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 <laughs> an enormous part of, as everybody here probably knows, uh, of doing this. So my question is, um, it, uh, not wanting to reinvent the wheel, uh, it seems like that's a, an obvious thing for machine learning. I'm just wondering if other people are working that space or? As far as I know, um, it's still a bit wide open, but I'm in complete agreement with you. Uh, I believe, I don't know if it's published, but I believe that uh, Hemant Sharma at Argonne had at least been looking at it in the context of uh, better segmentation. So kind of to get exactly what you were talking about. Uh, 
yeah, setting the parameters of, of like how big do you make the, the box around your samples and all those is, is kind of fussy. Uh, and, and there's no a priori easy way to do that without looking at some of the data, which is tedious. Uh, for sure, I see a big opportunity there. I, I know that they had thought about better segmentation anyways, because you know, segmentation is hard. Um, we have pretty easy data to segmentate, uh, I mean, to segment compared to a lot of things, like problems in like autonomous vehicle, uh, semantic segmentation where they can tell a pedestrian apart from a car, you know. But uh, I think that there's a huge opportunity there to apply probably tools that already exist in those arenas to do a better job of at least finding not just finding the signal, but getting quick metrics like what the extent is so that you could auto uh, auto fit parameters uh, for your study and kind of remove some of the human aspect. So I agree with you, it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing to learn as tedious and it does slow down the analysis. And during an in-situ test that gets worse is because if you're doing something, yeah. there's always plastic deformation, right? Your, your, your spots are gonna, they're not gonna stay the same shape and size that they are at the beginning of your test. And all of the interesting thing is ha interesting stuff is happening uh, when these things start to uh, smear out. So I think that there's definitely room for, at the very least in doing smarter segmentation of the signals in the beginning. Um, and that's not to say that you're doing things like on a global scale, trying to segment where all the signal is from background everywhere. Might be possible to do that uh, with better tools than we have right now. But even if you're only doing it at the local scale where you say, ah, the spot's gonna be around this pretty big area, you know, find the one that's closest to the, uh, where it's supposed to be and then uh, give me a, a size big enough to encompass the full tails. That seems like a tractable problem to me. I wish I had time to work on it myself, but <laughs> that would be a good contribution, actually. Um, Hamon's paper is on, on archive. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So they have, and I, that was, I forget who he was working with, but yeah, it was exactly the type of collaboration that we're talking about here. Uh, I, I don't even know if it was someone in comp at Argon. It might have been someone external, but um, yeah, I think that there's, there's, I feel like we're at a point in just the available of like the, the Python ecosystem of tools where just handing over the data and saying, can you make heads or tails of this? We're at the point where we can actually do that for a pretty wide variety of uh, samples that have already been published. You know, um, I think sharing and hosting the data that you need to actually uh, train models like that still is an issue because it, it's not like big data in the sense of industrial big data, but it's too big to email and too big to host. Uh. Oh, <laughs> so uh, the, the other thing point that I want to make is on that open data. So yeah. um, um, one of the things that we're doing through the Prism <laughs> Center is we have the Materials Commons, which is a, a pretty well advanced mm. repository. And, you know, we're basically, uh, Duncan is in the throes of, and he's testing Ashley and her group with this right now and how to use uh, a sort of HEDM data in a standardized template format and basically looking at data output from hex rd as sort of our our uh, uh, milestone for our template for that so um you know if uh, you know it's maybe something to bring you more into so you're aware of it but i don't yeah. know are you aware of anybody else that's sort of setting up hedm repositories Actually setting it up, no. I mean, we're talking about it, right? In our, uh, but some that actually has a real physical hardware that would be hosting this stuff, no, <laughs> not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, yeah, and 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 yeah. So, and part of this too has this. So we've got it. Obviously, we have limited storage. I mean, we've got capacity to go up to several hundred terabytes, uh, mm -hmm. but we're part of this national science data fabric. Uh, NSF proposal where we can get into the petabyte range. So, um, yeah. So just to let you know that at least as you're thinking about this, <laughs> near field data not so much, but at least far field data is inherently very sparse, and so you can compress the hell out of it. Um, and we uh, we we came up with a way of doing that in hex RD. I'm not sure what um, what Hamant does or and, and Fable is just basically trying to process the data, segment it globally at the beginning. Um, which can be very difficult for in a general sense, right? You're speaking of parameter selection, you know? Um, but we at least have a strategy, I think, for uh, 
reasonable compression that you don't throw away any real information because you look at those images, most of the pixels are not on those rings and they're dark. You can throw those away wholesale in the beginning and only worry about saving uh, pixels that are above, uh, you know, the only parameter you're really setting is a signal to noise cutoff, which is, is a reasonable thing to do, I think. But um, yeah, I, I, if we want to make progress in terms of um, really taking the automation and the analysis to the next level, then we're going to have to be able to host and share data sets uh, for people to try algorithms on. Because we'll need to do it on a, we can't just make something work on a single data set, of course. And at this point, we have, you know, it's not like we have a ton of data measured, but we have enough that spans kind of a, a pretty broad spectrum of uh, materials that are at least suitable for HDM analysis that I think that progress could definitely be made there. Um, it's a shame that thrusts like this don't get added when they talk about funding for you know, upgrades to the APS. They never talk about like the analysis and uh, software part of that, where it's like, you're gonna give us all these more photons and make our data rate even higher, yet we don't even, we can't even store it locally. They don't even have a data storage center uh, at Argonne. So there seems to be a yeah. little bit of a, uh, a disconnect there when it comes to this, but I think it's up to the, as everything with at least Argonne as an example, it's up to the user community to apply the pressure for the things that we actually need to get science done, you know? And it's not, we don't necessarily need more photons or more coherent photons. We we basically need ways to be able to archive and uh, attach a pedigree to all of our data, you know, and, and share them among the community. Uh, Great, thank you. <coughs> thank you for prisms. <laughs> <laughs> Um, any other questions from the audience? <coughs> uh, yeah, can I ask a question? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bernier. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, fantastic talk. Uh, we see the power of this uh, HDM techniques. Could you leave some comments on the connection between this uh, method skill techniques and the uh, deeds location skill research? Yeah, I've. Well, I think that there's there's already been. I uh, regret that I don't have. I'm trying to think if I have any re uh, references here, but uh, I know that Armand Bodwin, for one, and um, and Felicity, actually, the paper that's on archive, this one here. Uh, where is it? Here, down at the bottom there. This one that's up on archive. There, she's actually does have a discrete dislocation modeling framework um, to basically simulate the, the the framework can basically provide the. Uh, the intermittency on the, the stress drops uh, as, as part of the modeling output. But uh, there's another paper that was just published where uh, the Varga Naragani uh, that came from Purdue and is working at AFRL now, they basically were looking at incompatibility. Because oh. remember, we can't, they're looking at incompatible deformation fields based on a combination of far field and near field data. Because while we can't, we can't see, uh, we don't certainly aren't resolving individual defects here, but the information that we do have from the near field, mainly uh, the build buildup of uh, lattice curvature in the grain uh, can be directly tied to densities of dislocations, especially if you know which type, uh, which Berger's vectors you'd be looking for. But then DeVarker's paper, which I didn't get to shove in this talk here, is really interesting study. Um, where they actually distilled from the HDM data what would be the incompatible part of the deformation field. So a further connection to uh, the underlying dislocation distributions that are responsible for those. Uh, so I believe that I think that the we're seeing the aggregate effect of dislocation distributions. Uh, we can't resolve, obviously, if you know something about the material you're looking at from measurements at lower length scales like TEM, you can actually add a little bit more insight into what you're seeing from the modeling frameworks. But certainly the discrete dislocation modeling frameworks uh, can provide data that would help explain what you're seeing in terms of breakup in grains. Uh, and then maybe even in this case, like we looked at with this study here, uh, the fact that which grains have the biggest stress drops, you know, and if you zoom in a local neighborhood, like what's going on, is there some transfer of slip between multiple grains or uh, why are some grains having a stress buildup and sudden drop? Um, you know, we, we can't resolve why, but we can detect where they're happening and at least guide. I think that the name of the game is 
we use this to kind of get an ensemble view of when these events that are basically controlled by dislocation structures evolving, where they're happening in the local neighborhood. And at least you can, can, buy, you can um, guide a measurement that has resolution at the finer length scales to look at structures that would represent the area where you're seeing these localized events happen. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, that's as good as since we can't resolve it. That's as good as you can do. Is we can we can zoom in and say that you know neighborhoods of this type of misorientation with these types of grain boundaries seem to be doing something interesting. And then it's the job of a technique that actually has the lower length scale resolution to come in and maybe fill in some of the blanks. But I see the HEDM is filling the role of of being able to identify kind of critical events at a uh, aggregate scale. Uh, that could point to where you need to zoom in, even to fill in the blanks with uh, modeling information uh, or uh, complementary experimental information, whether that's you know micro focus, uh, Lowry diffraction, or or uh, electron microscopy. <coughs> oh, thank you. Um, well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We're already pretty over, but um, <laughs> so maybe we'll just thank Joel, and then um, if anyone wants to stick around, they're free to.